Well, good evening. So, thank you, three of you, for saying that back. I appreciate that. Um, hey, I am glad you guys are here. I'm going to ask you if you would do something for me. If you're sitting on one of these outside, because we're a little bit smaller here, and, and, and you know, I'd like to be a little bit more intimate, would you mind if you scooted in just a little bit towards the center, if you're kind of out far? I mean, there's a couple of you. Um, that way we can all be warm and cozy, and you know, if there was a fire here, just, we're just sitting in a, you know, in, a, in a family room just having a good time. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever had one of those days? Okay, you know, days I'm talking about where you just kind of say, what happened today? Okay, you wake up, everything seems it's going to be fine, and you, as soon as you walk out the door, it just seems like everything just goes downhill from that. And, and, and maybe how many of you have ever had like one of those weeks, okay, that it just has been a, not just a day, but it's like a week has been that way. How many of you have ever had one of those months, okay, where it's been, how many of you have ever had one of those years that's been kind of like that, okay? I mean, it, it is so true. I mean, there are just sometimes, some days, and it seems like it can just flip on us, doesn't it? I mean, things can be going well it, in, our, in our work, our relationships, at home, I mean, it just seems, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it just seems like, what just happened? I mean, it just, it, it's just, it, it's hard. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed, consumed. We feel like we're living underneath pressures. And it's hard to get out from above that, right? Am I the only one? No. I mean, you know what's amazing, though, too? Sometimes when we look at the people in Scripture, we think that maybe, or we don't see, or we, or we don't imagine them having times like that. We don't imagine these superheroes of our faith going through times where they're scared, maybe they have doubt, uh, maybe they're overwhelmed by the situation around and they're just tired or they're lonely. And it's just, but you know what? They did. And tonight we're going to look in, in, in Acts chapter 18 at, at the Apostle Paul and, and that's where we find him, right there in a place where he is just overwhelmed. He's tired, he's lonely, he's hurting. You know, let me kind of go through a couple, uh, um, kind of go through where, where Paul's been over the last couple chapters. For us, it's a couple chapters. For him, it was his life, right? Okay? And so, it, it, after he left Philippi, in chapter 16, I was here a couple weeks ago and taught on chapter 16. Remember, the very first convert in Europe, Lydia, um, accepted the Lord, her and her whole household. Um, then uh, Paul is teaching, and he, he gets arrested uh, remember, and uh, he gets, uh, because he, he actually cured a girl of a demon, and he's thrown into prison, um, and, and while he's there, they're worshiping, praising God, you know, earthquake happens, doors fly open, the jailer and his family end up through the whole set of circumstances, coming to know the Lord, exciting um, what's happened, and, and then um, they go from there to Thessalonica, and in Thessalonica, there's success, but there's persecution from the Jew Jewish um, people there, especially the Jewish leaders, and so he flees to Berea. And then he's in Berea, and he's teaching, and, 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 and there's great things happening there. And then the Jews from Thessalonica come there, and they start causing pro problems for him there. And so from there, he flees to Athens. And I'm sure you were in Athens last week, right, talking about what happened there. Just incredible opportunity, incredible, you know, um, experience of him there at Mars Hill, uh, of sharing with the people there about, you know, this unknown God to them, and he explains it was Christ. But, you know, it, it was just very few people really responded there. And so Paul leaves Athens, and um, he sends um, uh, Timothy and Silas to Macedonia, and he by himself makes a 53-mile walk to Corinth. Okay, so here he is, he, he arrives in Corinth. And let me, let me share a little bit about Corinth real quick. Now, Corinth had replaced Athens as the political and uh, commerce center in all of Greek. Um, it, it was a, a, a huge town. Um, because um, of its location, nearly all traffic, um, all, all commerce actually, um, between northern and southern Greece had to go straight through um, Corinth. And that means the wealth of all of Greece, of that world, came there, um, went through. They stopped there. Nearly 200,000 people 
um, could be in Corinth at any given time. But it, it wasn't, they, they weren't establishing that, that place as their home. I and mean, there, there was a lot of commuters, you could say, that were there in Corinth. Now, Corinth also, though, um, because of that, was one of the most wicked cities um, in all of the Roman Empire. In fact, the name Corinth came to mean profligate. I mean, you go, oh, that person's a Corinth. They go, oh, and if you don't know what profligate means, it means utterly and shamelessly immoral. You're just going to do whatever you want to do. It's hedonism at its best. And that's what Corinth basically became known for, is just uh, people outright doing whatever they wanted. And then also... In Corinth, towering 1,500 feet above Corinth was the Acropolis, was this huge hill, and on top was a temple to Diana. And part of the worship by Diana was for uh, basically temple prostitutes to be available for people to come up there and to worship through engaging in sexual acts. But also every night, nearly half of the, of the 1,000 temple priestess would go into the town to allow people to worship um, in their way throughout the city. It was just a city that was full of, of, it it, it was a a hard, it was a dangerous, um, and it was really a completely immoral city. Now, Paul arrives there, (coughs) excuse me, he's lonely, he's all alone there, Um, he is, he's worn out, every place he goes to, I mean, God is, is working, but man, he is fighting battle upon battle upon battle. His closest friends, he left there, the people that he's leading, but also were his greatest support. And he comes in and he's scared. Actually, he is scared coming into the city. It was probably like any, no other city he had ever been to. (coughs) Excuse me. In fact, we know, we read in in, um, uh, 1 Corinthians, if you, uh, I'll just read it here to you. It says in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 2 through 3. Paul says to the Corinth church as he, write, as, as he writes to them after he had, been, had made this journey there, he says, for I, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now we know that Paul could reason with people just as good as, or better than anyone. We saw that at Mars Hill, right? But he came there and he thought, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to, to preach Jesus and him crucified. The grace of God, the love of God demonstrated through Jesus to give us a new hope. And then he says this, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He was tired. Man, he he needed he needed a lot of um, encouragement. He needed support. He 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 was worn out. And what we're going to see here is really a beautiful picture of how God will just, through many sets of circumstances, come alongside us. And here we're going to see Paul and just meet these needs that he has, comfort him, give him confidence, give him assurance in many different ways. And in through that, though, we're going to see because of that, that, that what happens in Corinth goes much further than it would have ever gone had Paul just had to go through this by himself. He probably would not have stayed there very long at all. So let's go ahead and read um, Acts chapter um, 18 verses 1 through 4. And it says this. I'm going to stand up while I read this. Um, It says, And after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew there named Aquila, a, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, um, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and, and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. All right, so here he is. He's gotten there alone, and while he's there, he kind of sets up some business. You know, he's, he's working. He's a tent maker, and we'll get to that in just a sec. But he was alone, and he says he found Priscilla and Aquila. Now, we don't know exactly how they met, but they met, and they're believers, and they had just come from Rome. And, um, and, and it's interesting here. I mentioned, I think a couple weeks ago, I may have mentioned that, that you know, at this point, Claudius had um, kicked out all, all Jews from, from Rome. And the reason being is that there's, well, actually there's several different thoughts. But I think what the majority of theologians believe, and I, I think I would believe this too, is what was happening with Paul in terms of the Jews rising up against the Christians that were there and, and, and people that were coming to the Lord and, and they began to revolt and even kind of go before the officials, what was happening in Rome 
that the church was moving and working and people were coming to the Lord and the Jews that were living there were rising up against them and, and causing riots actually. So much so Claudius says, just I'll, they're all, kick them all out. I don't want them here anymore. And so they all kind of went to uh, throughout the region and, and, um, and, and, and so um, um, Ananias, or I mean, I mean Priscilla and Aquila, not, not Ananias and Sapphira, they're long gone by this time, but um, uh, Priscilla and Aquila are, are, find themselves in Corinth. Now, after arriving in Corinth, they established their business there, which was the same as, as, as Paul. Now, I don't know if you ever wondered, you know, if you thought, well, well Paul, you know, he, he became a missionary, he was, you know, he was a Pharisee, you know, he worked in, 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 that, in that, um, that realm, and he came to Christ, and so he had to find a trade, and so he, he became a tent maker. Well, actually, every young Jewish man was taught a trade. No matter what their profession may have been, they were all taught a trade. Because if all of a sudden, you know, something took place, you know, maybe their economy took a downturn or whatever it might be, they had something to fall back on. And so more than likely, uh, Paul's father was a tent maker as well. A, a worker with, actually with leather is what they talked about. They probably made tents out of leather. And so, so Paul knew, had this trade that he could do on his missionary journeys no matter where he was at. Because it was taught to him from a young age. And so he began to, to, to um, work together and to stay with um, Priscilla and Aquila. Now, um, it says that they were working together. And, and, and during this time, their relationship just began to grow and grow and grow. I mean, they became close. In fact, these two people became so key um, in, in the ministry of Paul's life. But also, these two people became so very, very close. A real encouragement, a, a very tight and close um, friendship, a really a brotherhood that they experienced between one another, uh, really for the rest of their lives. They were, they were incredibly close. Now, how about you? Think about this. Do you have people in your life that you just kind of, you know, you think about how we meet our friends, you know, there's a lot of different ways, right, that friendships kind of get established. Let, let me ask you a question. You can kind of, uh, you, we got a runner here, but, or you can just raise your hand and I can call and you can yell out really loud. But um, how, you know, I mean, think about it, a good friends or good friends that you have. How did you meet them? You want to share? Yeah? What's that? High school. high school. You met them in high school. Met them at church in a Bible study. Anyone else? No one else has friends? I do. Who's talking? Okay, there you are. I have three of the best girlfriends. We met in kindergarten. We're still friends. In kindergarten, Their wow. Their kids are second generation friends. That's amazing. That is awesome. You know, when you, I hear that, I think about my grandparents. My grandparents were 96 and 90. Uh, my grandmother was almost 94 when they, when they passed away. They passed away four months apart. Uh, they met when they were four and five. And they grew up across the street from each other. Uh, they didn't have a memory where the, the other one wasn't a part of it. And um, it's just so great. Relationships like that, you know, they start from very young. I want to pause here real quick. If you, if you guys could adjust the lights just a little bit so it's not quite so bright because everyone is really kind of washed out. And I, I really like to, to be able to look at you guys while I, while I talk to you and actually see you. But, you know, I think about some friends of mine, um, some very close friends. One of my best friends, my, probably my best friend I've ever had, uh, passed away about eight years ago. And we were like brothers. And we met um, from being at the church, and, and um, we were kind of sarcastic together. We had, a great person, we had similar personalities, and, and we really walked through life and through some big things in each other. It was, it was hard. One of my closest friends right now, in fact, I meet with him every Wednesday, every Wednesday morning. Actually, we met this morning. Um, we meet for about an hour and a half um, every week, and we're just an encouragement to each other. He's a pastor at a church up in Phoenix. I was, a, I was in student ministry for many years, and he was in my youth group. And, uh, and so he, he was in my high school group, and as he got out and got into the ministry, I kind of mentored him, and that, and that mentorship thing just turned into a really great relationship. And I praise God for how, how he brings people into our lives. And with Paul, he really, God really brought these two people into his life at a strategic, important time when Paul was very down and very low. Here, let's read here in Acts um, 18. Let's pick up um, verse 5. It says that when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, now real quick, before, before I read this, so this is what's going on. They're working throughout the week, and, you know, a regular work week, and then Paul, every Sabbath, is in, is teaching, is talking, is, is sharing Christ with people um, in the synagogues, okay? So it's kind of like, maybe like our, our life, 
okay? Um, working on the weekends, he's sharing Christ. Now, this, then, then all of a sudden, Silas and Timothy arrive from Macedonia in verse 5. And Paul devoted himself from that point on with the word, testifying to the Jews that, that the Christ was Jesus. And when the, the opposer resisted and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So Silas and Timothy, they arrived from Macedonia, and, and they, had, they had collected, um, their churches in Macedonia had given uh, money to, to help support Paul and, and, and the missionary journey. It was not like, like we support missionaries as they go out to other countries. There are churches there. In fact, some of these churches were, were, were very poor, but they gave, you know, even, even in their poverty, they gave in an incredible way to help support Paul and, and, and the team as they're on their missionary journey. And so when they came, I mean, n- number one, Paul was encouraged by just by having Silas and Timothy back with him. He loved these men. So it was such an encouragement to him to have them working aside, but beside them. Now, now there's all the, the, these, these four, four people working together. But then also he stopped making tents and he just devoted himself completely, daily, to sharing the gospel, sharing the word um, in the synagogues and on the streets and throughout, throughout Corinth. And, and, and you know, it would be, it'd be so cool to really see, you know, what actually um, Paul did and how he was sharing, but we don't really don't have that. We only have a couple little verses here to really know all that God was doing here. But we also know that in this, Paul was constantly in this town receiving resistance. And not just people rejecting what he had to say, but threats. Threats on his life. Um, there were um, men who wanted to kill him. I mean, remember Paul started off in Acts as a persecutor of the church. Well, he wasn't the only persecutor of the church. There were other zealous Jews who wanted to kill Christians. And now he became number one on the hit list. I mean, he was their man and he, he, he went to the other side. And not only was he just, you know, in, in the, not just in around Jerusalem, but he was going around throughout the earth, around all their known world, to other cities and establishing. And I mean, if there was someone that was hated, it was probably him. I mean, he was a Pharisee, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And so Paul's going, and it says in, um, in here that, that as he was teaching, as he was preaching, it says that they were resisting him. Now that word resist is a very interesting word. Resist um, actually means, if you want to hear the Greek word um, pronounced wrongly, it's um, antitasso, okay? Antitasso. And it literally means to arrange in battle array. They were actually coming up um, and, and, and physically threatening him in battle array, resisting him to the point of conflict, physical conflict is what they were doing. And Paul's standing there, there's just him and just a few people. But um, Paul would still go to the synagogues. Now, why? Why would Paul continue to go to the synagogues? I know it was his custom that he did that, but have you ever stopped to think, why? Why would Paul go Every city to the synagogues, every city knowing that they're going to reject him, that, 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 that they're going to maybe hate him, that they may even threaten him. But, but why? Do you have any thought or any idea as to why he would continue to go to the synagogues? Any thoughts? Go ahead and say that again. His friendship with them? Is that... That he would continue to be used by God? Okay. Oh, because of that friendship, he had the courage to continue to do that. Okay. 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 Yeah, great. I mean, I think definitely he had that courage. Any, any other thoughts? No, no wrong answer, you know, just what do you think? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Completely sold out to Christ. He wanted anyone to hear. Definitely. I definitely believe that. Both of those, I think, are, are, are so right. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Possibly guilt. Okay, guilt. Okay. We know that, that Paul struggled with, um, uh, with his guilt for persecuting the church. There's no doubt about it. In fact, he um, says that he wasn't even worthy to be an apostle. I think we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Um, anything else? Yeah. Because uh, he used to be the same. Okay. 
So it used to be the same. Or those were his countrymen, right? Right. Yeah. You know, I think all of you are right, but I think at the core of that is that those men or those people were, were fellow Jews. They, they, were, they were the tribe of Israel. And if he wanted anybody, anybody to know the Lord, he wanted his brothers um, that, that he has had his whole life to understand. He loved them so much. He loved them so much. And I'll bet that all of us, at some point, First of all, wait, let me, let me kind of go before I go there. Let me say this. I want you to think about maybe someone in your life that you love. Now, do you have anyone in your life that you love and care about? Yeah? Most everyone? Would you say, raise your hand if you do. If there's someone in your life you love and you care about. Okay, well, I guess not everyone, all right? Um, but so, so most all of us do have people in our life that we really do love and that we really do care about. Now, do you have anyone in your life that, that you know that, that, that don't know the Lord that you love and care about? Okay, yeah. So we understand, we, we, we probably understand what Paul felt, right? People that he loved and cared for, they didn't know the Lord. That he wanted desperately to know the Lord. I want you to think about maybe one person right now. Just think about one person in your life that you really love and care about that doesn't know the Lord. I just want you to, 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 to just picture their face right now. And hold it there, because I'm going to come back to that, Okay. So Paul continues to go, but as he goes at, to a, at a certain point, it says all of a sudden after being there one time, he did something pretty amazing. It, it says that he, um, when they opposed and resisted and reviled him, it says he shook out his garments, first of all. That was huge. What, what they did, for, for a Jew, that was, um, that, was, that was an intense thing to do because sh to shake out your, your garments was, it was a Jewish gesture of rejection, and oftentimes what they would do is, is, is Jews were leaving a Gentile region or a Gentile nation. As they got to the border, what they would do is they would go and they'd shake the dust off of their, off of their clothes. Like, I don't even want the dust of this place to be on me. As, as basically a, a statement of their hatred for this, you know, non-Jewish, this Gentile, this heathen land that he, they had just been in. And so when he stands up and he shakes off the dust... They were like, what? I mean, this is one of their fellow Jews that were shaking the dust saying, I want nothing to, I reject you. I want nothing to do with you, is what Paul is saying here. He's so angry, so frustrated. There's so much going on. And then he says this, your blood be upon your heads. I am innocent. And what he's saying is this, basically saying that they are fully responsible for what they're doing. He goes, you're rejecting Christ. You're not rejecting me, you're rejecting Christ. And you, he's stating that, that he had tried to share with them and their rejection and the consequences of their rejection of Christ is basically fully upon them. He's innocent. He's saying, I tried, I reject you, you reject, because what they were doing, and what it says they, re, they reviled him, another translation says that they were blaspheming Jesus is what they were doing. They were mocking Jesus. And, uh, and so Paul says, I'm done. I'm done with you, I'm gone, and that's it. And when this happens, when this happens, I mean, they are incredibly infuriated. You know, you know it's amazing what Paul says here is, is a real truth. Because are we, it, when, the people that we know that don't know the Lord, are we required to make sure that they make a decision to, to come into a relationship with Jesus? Yes or no? No. What's our job to do? To share them. What did you say? We're to be witnesses, right? Uh, be witnesses through our lives and who we are, but also in sharing the message of Jesus with them. That's all that God wants us to do. That's our call. And then those who come to Christ help them mature and become disciples to, that, that we're doing the same, that we're investing in each other. It's not our job to make someone do that. You know, several, several years ago, I talked about before that I was in student ministry and college ministry. And I was up in Lancaster in the high desert for 11 years as a youth and adult pastor there. And there was a community college there that I decided, hey, we wanted to get onto the college. We wanted to begin to reach out to college students on that, on that campus. And so I went and became a student there, um, and, and, and I, I took 
took a very difficult class. It was a challenging class. It was volleyball. And um, so I took a volleyball class so I could be a student, and then I formed a club because as a student, I could form a club. And it was a service club. We just wanted to serve people needs and open up um, opportunities to dialogue and to discuss a lot of different issues. So, so it was service, and it was a time to, to enter. Kind of what, and I got this from Paul. Paul would reason with people where he went. And so we wanted to reason. What we would talk about is dialoguing together about a lot of different things. Now, when I was in um, submitting the paperwork, they said, hey, you don't have a professor to, um, uh, to, to sponsor this. Now, I, there was a kid who was in my high school group that I knew his dad was a, was a professor there. And, and so I went over to his, to his class, or actually to his office, and I said, hey, and I asked him if he would do it. And he goes, sure. Now, the thing about him, Mark, was Mark was a, a devout atheist. Um, he was, he taught biology and science and, and he taught every day about that there is no God and, and that, and he, and knowing me, okay, I had met him many times and, and, um, we had some good conversations. So all of a sudden I have an atheist now who is, you know, the, the, the professor sponsor over our club that reaches out to people with the message of Christ. It was fun. I just want you to know. And I loved Mark, and Mark loved me, and we talked about Jesus a lot. And his wife began to come to our church, and then his other son began, began and mainly because his youngest son was so on fire for the Lord. And he, he, he won his, his brother to the Lord, he won his sister to the Lord, he won his mother to the Lord, and Mark was the only one that was, and, and, but he was coming regularly. And you know what about Mark? Mark and I had great conversations, but it wasn't up to me to make sure that Mark became a Christian. And Mark still isn't. He still goes to church. He's still seeking. He still has questions. But he's there. And, you know, and what God wants us to do is to be witnesses like Paul. And Paul came to the point where he says, I'm done. I'm going to go to the, I, I'm done fighting. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Now look here in verse 7. Verse 7 he says, And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. And his house was next door to the synagogue. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord and together. I'm sorry I'm laughing, but this is such a funny, I love this section of passage here, okay? Um, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. Isn't that funny? Do you see, do you see kind of what's going on there? The Jews, and the Jewish leaders especially, are completely rejecting what Paul is saying. Rejecting him, threatening him. Okay, um, physically attacking him. Paul is really scared for his life. So he goes, I'm done with you, shaking his off. He goes, you know, what your decision's on your head. I'm going to go to the Gentiles, and he goes next door. He goes next door. I'm sure, I'm sure that infuriated them even more, okay? Because right now, to, to a man named, by the name of, um, of Justice, uh, of Titus Justice, and um, now, ooh, sorry, Titus Justus, he was a Roman, so more than likely, many people's name was probably Gaius Titus Justus was, was his name, Titius Justus. And, um, and, and, and he lived next door to the synagogue, and so he began to do ministry outside of the home that was right next door to the synagogue that he had just shaken his clothes off of and rejected. And it says then, because of his ministry, that Crispus, who was the leader of the synagogue, and his whole household became believers of Jesus. I love that. I love that. Crispus at one point was probably one of the ones who was rejecting him, fighting against him. And eventually he becomes a follower of Jesus. Now, I'm not you, I just think that's so cool. I mean, I just get, I kind of get giddy about that, about what was going on there. And you know, Gaius and Crispus are actually mentioned in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 14. When Paul is writing back to them, and there's problems in the church, and, and many people are saying, I'm of Apollos, meaning the Apollos, you know, baptized me, and some say I'm of Paul, Paul baptized, and Paul goes, who, who, who is, who's Paul? Who's Paul? I mean, it's Jesus. He's the one. Now, maybe so implanted, and, and I cultivated, but Jesus is the one who saves you. And he, Paul says, I know of, all, all I baptized was Gaius and Crispus, and, and, and apart from one other family. Other than that, I don't think I baptized anybody. So Paul himself baptized both Gaius and, and Crispus, and, and more Corinthians are coming to the Lord. And it just goes to make me think that when God is moving, there's nothing anyone can do to stop it. You know? I mean, people can physically assault, physically threaten they, 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 can, they, can, they can array themselves in, in battle, being ready for battle. And to God, it's nothing. 
It really isn't. You think for God, he, you think he's ever really threatened by anything that we can do, anything we can say? In fact, the Bible says that God regards the nations as less than nothing and meaningless. Their strength is like a drop in a bucket. We were, my wife and I were talking about the, um, with our kids, m- m- my, my son and daughter-in-law were at our house this weekend. They were visiting from California, and we were talking, and we mentioned the Grand Canyon, and they go, so my son goes, you know, Grand Canyon was made over, you know, erosion. I go, no, God just went like this. That's the Grand Canyon, joking around. But I think God could just didn't even have to do this. You know, he could have just said, Grand Canyon, and it was there. He, he spoke the, the world into existence. And so when, when men try to fight against him, um, God's not concerned. Now, we, when we fight on, on, for the Lord, we can, we can get down. Like I said, it can be hard. It can be dis- discouraging. Sometimes it can be scary. And, 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 and during those times, God wants to, to build up and God wants to um, uh, encourage us. In fact, some of the greatest revivals in history happened during times of persecution. At one point, China, um, you know, kicked out all foreign missionaries um, when communism took over. And for 40 years, For 40 years, not a single missionary was allowed to come into China. Not one. And when they opened the gates, now before then, the church was about 40,000 people. They believed in all of China, about 40,000 believers. When they opened the gate, I mean, churches and people had been praying for years and years from them were were, were scared that the church was non-existent. That 40,000 was almost 4 million during that time of persecution during that time where it was illegal to follow Christ, to read your Bible, to meet for worship. To God, a government saying no doesn't mean anything to him. In fact, all that does is just say, have people say, you know what, am I gonna be committed to the Lord or I'm gonna be scared of the government? My commitment, my love is for the Lord. So, here's here's Paul though. Good things going on, right? People come to the Lord. In fact, the ruler of the synagogue is doing it. He's kind of gone away. But, but what Paul did in terms of shaking his clothes out, calling upon you know, that rejection, all it did is just amp up uh, the, the Jewish um, uh, mob, basically, in, in a greater way. And Paul was scared. He was scared. He was probably scared for the, the people that were there as well, the other Christians. He was tired still. And he was like, I mean, he was in a place, he felt like he was probably over his head. And, and we don't know what he was doing or everything he was contemplating, but we do know that he was at least thinking, I'm gonna, I think it's time to go. I think it's time to go. You know, this is, this is getting really dangerous. I don't want people to get hurt, possibly. That's speculation, but we know that he was scared. It, because um, God, all of a sudden, came in and decided he needed to encourage Paul just with his own words. From his mouth. And so we look at um, verse 9 here. And in verse 9 it says this, And so, and the Lord said to Paul, one night in a vision, Do not be afraid. And he starts off with, don't be scared. And he wasn't starting off, don't be scared because it's me, but don't be afraid anymore, Paul. He goes, don't. He goes, go on speaking and do not be silent. He goes, because I'm with you. And no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And so because of this word from God, very short, he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Pretty amazing. This is one of six different visions that Paul has directly from God in the book of Acts. Chapter 9, verse 12, you've probably already seen this one. Uh, or chapter 16, 9 through 10, this, this one in 18. Chapter 22, 17 through 18. Chapter 23, 11. And chapter 27, 23 and 24. All where God comes speaks to him in a vision. To encourage him. To give him direction. And, you know, and, there, and there's four parts. There's four things that God says to Paul in here. And, and I think that we all can take note of these things. We all need to hear them and understand them for ourselves. 
because we all find ourselves in places where we're scared. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you feel a sense of, of maybe sharing Christ, maybe in a situation that's maybe difficult and you're scared to do it? Have you ever experienced that? Or am I the only one? Okay? We can. We can feel a, a timidity, a fear. Maybe go the route of passivity. Or maybe we're in a place where there's a lot of people who have a lot of um, maybe very harsh and angry attitudes towards the church. And we feel like maybe we're alone. And, and our world's getting more and more that way. And, and so, first of all, God says this. Don't be afraid. And, 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 and what does he, the reason he gives them for not being afraid? Because I'm with you. He goes, Paul, don't be afraid. I'm with you. You're not alone. And I'm not talking about, you know, Silas and, Ty, and, and Timothy and, and, and Aquila and Priscilla and, and now Gaius. And, and I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about me. I am with you. Don't be afraid. You know, and God says it to all of us, doesn't he? In fact, all through Scripture we read about God saying, don't be afraid. I'm with you. And jo he said this to Joshua. Here's Joshua is getting ready to take a, you know, you know, the children of Israel into the promised land, a, a, a battle, an army that's untrained, okay, against formidable cities and strong armies. And he's a little nervous. And God, in, in the beginning chapter, over and over and over says, do not be afraid. Be of courage, and in verse 9, it says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not tremble or be dismayed. Or it basically, be, don't be depressed, don't be, don't be scared. He goes, why? Because I'm with you. I'm going to go before you. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. What's the last thing he says? And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He goes, I will be with you until the end of time. I'll never depart you. The, it, it, God says, he's, it, Jesus says, I need at least so the helper can come to us. The Holy Spirit, so he lives inside of us. Something that the people didn't, during this, you know, before didn't have. The Jewish people didn't have that. And, and what kind of spirit does he give us? He says in Timothy, he tells Timothy, I haven't given you a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. I'm with you, Always. It's an encouragement that, that he gives us, that he gives Paul, and, and that we can hold on to. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you've been scared because you, you need to do something. I was talking about sharing Christ. For, for three and a half months, I lived in England when I was in college during the summer months. And I, working with a church there, kind of establishing a, a youth ministry there. But the missionary there um, was a Jamaican, and Delroy Brown, not to be mistaken with Leroy Brown, okay, Delroy Brown, and, and Delroy was this incredible guy, and we got there, and we were jet-lagged, uh, me and this other person that were there from our church, and, and like the, the first night, I mean, or actually the next night, because we got in late, he goes, hey, we're going to go for a drive, go, okay, and he drove for like an hour, and we stop at this, at this intersection in this town, and he goes, all right, guys. And there are like three pubs. On, on four corners, three of the corners had pubs, and, which is very common in, in, in England. And, uh, and he goes, now, in that pub two nights ago, there was a person that was uh, stabbed and died. Go into all those pubs and, 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 and share Christ with them. I'll be back in three hours. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go speak to a bunch of English drunks. All right, that sounds great. I was a little scared. You know what we did before we went into any, any one of those pubs? Man, we, get, we got into an alley right next to one and we prayed. We prayed for three hours. No, I'm just kidding. And we, we prayed, okay, for, for God, just give us boldness, give us strength. We know you're with us. And we went in and it was an amazing night. We were there for three and a half hours talking with people, prayed with like four people and, and it, it, was, it was awesome. It was pretty fun to talk to drunks about Jesus. It's really an interesting experience. I want you to know that. But you know, God is with us and he says, you don't have to be afraid. And the second thing he says to him is, don't stop speaking about me. Don't stop talking about me. Keep doing it. I'm with you, don't be afraid. You need to do that. And I want you to think about that person that I asked you to think about earlier? Do you have their, their face in your mind? Just one, not all. If, the, if it's the whole family, just pick out one. You know, when everyone talks about, whenever anyone talks about sharing Christ, that's the, that's the name or that's the person that comes to your mind. That's the person I want you to think about that. And I want you to think about them in this way. They're your one life. 
They're your one life. Now, the whole world, we want the whole world to come to the Lord, and that can seem daunting. Or maybe you have like 50 people that you know that don't know the Lord, and they go, how am I going to make a difference there? Well, I just think about one. Just one. One life. They're your one life. I want to I challenge you to do something. I want to double-dog dare you to do something. I want to challenge you to commit to praying for that person every single day day. Just pray for them. Pray God. Pray that God will open up doors and converse, spiritual conversations to have with them. Just with one, just one person. Now, if someone else comes along, don't reject them, okay? But, but just one person. Can you imagine if the hundred people or so that are here, all of us dedicated to do that and said, God, I'm going to pray for them and I'm going to be available to talk to them. I'm going to build a relationship with them. I'm not, and I'm just not going to build a relationship so I can win them to the Lord. No, I'm going to build a relationship because you love them and I want to love them and I want to know that they're loved. Whether they ever come to the Lord or not, I want them to know they're loved and that they would know that God loves them. And they have an opportunity for him because of their relationship with me. And to pray for them day and day. Can you imagine? It, and I believe, wouldn't it be amazing if like this place just doubled just because all of us committed to one? Just one. I want you to think about that. Because we may come back to that a little bit later. One person. One life. Okay. Second thing, don't stop speaking. The third thing is, no one will attack and harm you. Now, that's a good one, okay? I'm with you always. Don't be afraid. Keep speaking. And by the way, I'm not going to allow anyone to physically harm you. No one's going to, because Paul was afraid of that. He was scared. I mean, they were getting physical with him. They were threatening him. There were death threats, okay? Um, I don't know if they had like little cutout, you know, notes with little cutout letters on there, and he was getting them in the, underneath his, uh, his door, but they were threatening him. And so um, he says, don't be afraid. Now, we know, well, Paul had a promise here that he wouldn't be physically harmed. Now, we know that that wasn't true of Paul in his life. You read 2 Corinthians, shipwrecked. Three times he received the, 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 the 39 lashes. One time he was dumped over the city wall, so they thought he was dead. I mean, he, was, he says, I'm threatened by my countrymen, by my enemies, I, 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 you know, he talked about, he, he went through a lot physically and relationally and in his missionary journeys, but God's promise here was, no one's going to harm you here. I guarantee it. And the last thing is, he goes, I have many in this city who are my people. But, and it wasn't like he said that there's many in the city who are already believers. What he was saying was, there's many in the city that I know are going to accept me. Now, so if we go into a whole debate on, on a lot of different things, okay, with this, like did God, God make them accept him or, or whatever, and, and, and I would say, according to several scriptures, that number one, Psalm 139 says that God knows us. He knows what we're thinking before we think it. He knows us before we ever came into being. Um, he knows what we're going to say before we say it. He knows our routine. Um, I mean, it, read Psalm 139 from, from beginning to end, especially the first seven verses, he goes, God knows me. I'm intimately acquainted with who you are. Romans 8, 28, we know that verse, right? God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Well, the next verse says, you know, um, who God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That word to foreknow, um, this is literally what it means. It's, um, the Greek word for that is um, um, proegno, and it means to know beforehand or to foresee. That means that God knows beforehand those who will accept him and those who won't. doesn't mean he makes them or doesn't make them. He just knows beforehand. He foresees it. Our lives are but a vapor. That He sees the whole thing at once, and he knows. And so he says, I know that there's a lot of people here who need to hear me and are going to receive me. I want you to stay here because there's a lot of people that need to come to me. That's what he's saying. So Paul decides because of this to stay for another year and six months, 18 months. He stays there. He works. He, he does things. And, and you know, the, the, the anger and the threats don't go away. But Paul, there's, we, don't, we don't see a lot, but there seems to be a renewed confidence that Paul had that he was going to be safe. The fear may have disappeared because of that vision from the Lord. 
But you know what? Then the Jews basically kind of get to a point towards the end of this time where they um, basically take a chapter out of the How to Stop Jesus and His Followers book, okay? They killed Jesus by taking him before who? The Roman officials, right? Now, that's what they thought. Now, we know he came to die. They didn't know that. They thought that they had taken him before and they had tricked um, basically the Roman government into crucifying him. So all of a sudden, they're going to take, that, take a chapter out of that book and try to do something similar with Paul. So let's read here in verse 12. It says this. But when Gal- Gallio um, was proconsul of Acacia, or of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack. Now listen to this. The Jews made a united attack on Paul. He, they physically brought him before the tribunal or b- b- by, the, by the judgment seat, saying... This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, um, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge on these things. And he drove them from the tribunal or drove them from the judgment seat. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, the new ruler of synagogue, because Christmas, remember, he accepted the Lord. He stepped down and beat him in front of the the tribunal, in front of that judgment seat. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So this is, let me tell you what goes on. Now, Gallio was a Roman, um, the proconsul of Achaia, of that area, basically of that, of that region. He was the, the ruler, the one who made judgment and, and made sure that things were happening the way that uh, Roman law intended them to happen. And sometimes a proconsul, when they would make judgments on issues, it's kind of like our court system now, where, where if all of a sudden a court, if in this court there's a judgment made on something, then that sets a precedent, for all courts, right? Okay? And so, so oftentimes when a pro council, even in a region like this, would make a, 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 a judgment, it would now be a precedent that would be set within most of the Roman Empire. And so this is what they tried to do. Now, let me share a little about Galilee, actually, first of all. Now, he was brother of Seneca. Now, Seneca was a, was, was a famed Roman philosopher who actually was Nero's, Emperor Nero's tutor growing up. He was his tutor. Now, this is what his brother said about him. Now, now you, you think, if you want to know what, who, who a person really is, you need to listen to what their family says you are, right? You ask my brother, he'll tell you what I am, or my sons, okay? They'll tell you who I am. But this is what his brother said about him. This is pretty neat. He says, he's an intelligent person who hated flattery and was blessed with an unaffectedly pleasant personality. It's pretty nice. He's a humble guy. He doesn't want to be flattered. He doesn't got like people are kind of kissing up to him to get ahead. He goes, no, don't flatter me. And he has a pretty much pleasant personality. I mean, he, he doesn't have this, this emotional spikes. He doesn't, he's not a hothead. Pretty pleasant person to be around. Pretty even keel, a good ruler, okay? He's not, he's not ruled by his emotions. Not like in the book of Esther, we see King Nazareth. So it's completely ruled by his emotions, okay? That's not who um, Gallio was. Now, the judgment seat, or the tribunal, as it's, it, it, some versions say, was a large raised stone platform that, that was outside the proconsul's home. And it was in the, um, the agora, or the marketplace, and, and, and it, it was like a public, um, what do you call it, a public court for people to see what was going on. And so the Jews came united and grabbed Paul and took him before this judgment seat. And this was their plan. They were going to say... He, he is preaching a, a, a God that is contrary to our law. And they began maybe to use names of Jesus and use other terms and to try to explain, it, to, to plead their case, okay, about how it is wrong, it's different. Now, during this time, the Roman government looked at um, the Jewish religion and they basically tolerated it, they allowed it. Okay, um, as, as something that they could do. They, they allow their own laws, some of their laws to still hold true, and they allowed to worship God for the most part how they wanted to. And so, and they, at this point, they viewed Christianity as a sect of Judaism. Almost like maybe it was like another denomination. 
And, and, and so as Gallio was listening to them, this is what Kenny was doing. He was like, okay, I see maybe like, maybe like you know, there, there's some denominations who maybe have a different view on baptism or maybe a different view on um, the gifts of the Spirit or a different view on some things. And he goes, you're, you're using terms and words and situations that don't make sense to me. It's obvious it has everything to do with your, with your law, with your religion, but, but there, he hasn't done anything that break our law. There's no, no, no evil thing that's going on here. So um, he kind of stops. Now, before he says all this, as he's thinking this, after they get through talking, completing their, their case, Paul begin, opens his mouth says, to, to, to defend himself, to plead his case. And Gallio just kind of cuts over him and says kind of what I just said to you, what we just read, and he basically makes a summary decision and he throws it out. And then he says, now guys, get out of here. I don't want to see you anymore. You know how cool this is? God says, you know, I'm going to protect you, Paul. Don't worry about it. Paul didn't even have to plead his case. He, he went to open it, and then Gallio just said, no, sorry, done, out of here. And when he said done, he meant done. And they were so angry that the mob grabbed Sosthenes, who was, who was the ruler right now in the synagogue, running the synagogue, and they began to beat him right there before the judgment seat, right there before Gallio. You know what Gallio is? I don't know, whatever. He, he didn't give it any attention. Now, there's some speculation as to why they beat up Sosthenes. Um, it, w- most people believe it's one of two things. Either Sosthenes was the one who was presenting the case against Paul, and they felt like he blew it. And so they attacked him. Or, because we find out later on that Sosthenes actually becomes a Christian as well. It's kind of funny that all the rulers of the synagogue keep becoming Christians. <laughs> I love it, okay? And, um, and so he becomes actually one of the leaders, one of the main people in the church there in Corinth. And so we don't know what reason it was, but for whatever reason, they, they kind of take it out on Sosthenes. And, um, and, and basically, you know, Paul says um, um, they keep on going. Now, God kept his promise to Paul in, in, in a pretty amazing way here. Um, he worked through the government to allow them actually for have the door to swing even wider open for them to actually share. They had complete freedom. And now the Jews were not allowed to attack him because of the ruling that he made. You notice what Paul didn't do? When, when Saucy says, I, I know, this is just the terms. You're all kind of, it's all the same thing. You just are disagreeing on some points. You know what Paul does? Paul doesn't say, oh, no, no, time out, time out, time out. No, we're completely different. They don't accept the Messiah, which is Jesus. And, and this, and he, he didn't all of a sudden, Paul didn't say, no, we're not the same. Paul said, yeah, it's fine. He didn't care. He didn't care that they thought that they were the same Jewish sect. He just knew that it was an open door to be able to share Christ in a greater way, more freedom. It didn't matter if they, what they thought was wrong. He was sharing the truth, and eventually they were going to hear the truth. And we don't need to get hung up if people don't see us the right way, see the church the right way. You know, a lot of people don't see the church. In fact, a lot of people now, nowadays, we, you can run into people who've never been to church, right? When I was growing up, when I was a kid, most people have been to church. You know, around in the 90s, as a youth pastor, I realized, man, we're, we're dealing with a lot of young people who have never been to church once. Actually, never even really heard of Jesus all that much. Or have no idea what, what he means. There's a lot of people who have a lot of weird ideas about, about the church, about Christ. But you know, you, know, it's a, you know, they're not the enemy. They're not the enemy. You realize that? Now, they may do some things that hurt the church, but they're not the enemy. They're deceived by the enemy. Now, the enemy can use them to do some things, but you know what we need to do more than anything is to is still love them in an incredible way. Isn't that what Paul did when he was captive in Rome? And the Praetorian guard was, was, was on either side of him, and, and, and he, he said, oh, great, I get to witness to some people, you know, for their whole shift. Maybe when they were beating him, he was going to love them. He was going to pray for them. He, he was going to share with them. And Paul's attitude went beyond his circumstance. He, he was at a place at this now where he wasn't living under because of his encouragement, what God was doing in his life, he was living above. His confidence was in God and what he was doing there. Okay, I've got six minutes here. I kind of want to share now what, what we're doing now. You know, and really, I'll share something. I'm, I'm going to share it. I don't care. Okay. Um, I think about our lives, and I want you to think about your life. If you've seen God move and work in a way that really was kind of supernatural, where he just kind of set some things up, 
where, where something happened. It wasn't like, it was one of those times you could say, wow, what a coincidence. But it wasn't a coincidence. It was God moving and working. And I bet you all of us have had those times. If you haven't, believe me, if you, you keep seeking God, you're going to have them. Where God kind of moves. I was a part of a team that was going to be setting up a, 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 a second campus from our church. Not here, the church has that before. In the city of Monrovia. I was going to be the lead person. And... And, and we went there, and I began to really, we began to pray for the city. We'd go like three days a week, this, a few people and I. We'd, we'd go in sec, different sections of the city, just pray for the city. We can connect with other churches and begin to build relationships. And they had this, this the city had this, um, the, this volunteer day, kind of like our second Saturdays, except it was like throughout the whole, the whole city. And, and I heard about it. I got really excited about it. I love to be able to reach out to the community in, in very practical ways, hands-on ways. And I noticed that they didn't have a, a, um, a major um, sponsor. And so I said, well, how much is a major sponsorship? And they said, they told me, I go, okay, we'll do it. So CCV Monrovia is going to do that. Now, we didn't even have a church service there yet, okay? And in fact, we were probably eight months away, uh, but we said, we're going to do it. And so we went there and we did that because of that, there, you know, on the, on the billboard it said, you know, major, the major, you know, sponsor, you know, CCV, you know, Christ Church of Valley Monrovia. And the mayor's like, who's that? And so she, someone pointed at me and she goes, hey, let's have lunch. So I got to have lunch with the mayor. And, and, and I, began to, I began to ask her, what, what, what do you need in the city? What, what can a church like us do to try to, you know, benefit what's going on? We had this great conversation. And she talked about the schools. So I began to, I went to the, to the superintendent of schools, and I said, you know, you know hey, and, and, and they had a good relationship with the churches there already. And so all of a sudden, long story short, there's this program that was developing already, but then because of just some of the things that were going on on this new side, they kind of went for it, and, and basically we were going to get to be a chaplain for a school. So if any families in the school were going through some problems, they would contact our church to help them. Okay, now that, that's just crazy, especially in California. It doesn't happen. I met with the principal, and, and I said, hey, we, and she was so excited. And I said, yeah, we don't, we don't have offices here yet or anything. She goes, hey, do you want, I, I have an extra office. How would you like to have an office in the school? And, and it's like over, and then I was talking with the police department. They go, hey, we need some new chaplains. Would you like to be a chaplain? You know, we, we have this background stuff, but, you know, we'll kind of streamline it. You can become a chaplain in the police department. You go on some ride-alongs. And actually, you can be a part. If something happens in a family, in the community, we'll call you when you're on call, and you can come, and you can help those people through that hard time. And it's like, I just, I kept coming back going, you'll never guess what happened today. Oh, you never guess what happened today. And it wasn't like, I wasn't having to like knock down anything. It's like people were going, yes, we want, yes. It was like doors are open. And it was one of the funnest things in the world to watch God move and work. Now, I wish that happens every day in my life. It doesn't. But it was exciting. It's exciting when we see God moving and working. Okay, let me read here, verse 18 through 23. I've got uh, two minutes and 55, 54, 50, okay, seconds to go. Here we go. After this, Paul stayed many days longer, after what happened at the judgment seat, and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila at uh, Centria, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow, and they came to Ephesus, and he left, and le left them there, and he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews, again, going there because he loves them. And when they asked him to stay for a longer period of time, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, hey, I will return if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. And when he had landed in Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church. And then he went down to Antioch. And after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next, gain through the region of Galatia and Phrygia and, and strengthening the disciples. You know, he took Priscilla and Aquila when he left. And, and then he left them um, uh, and actually, who he left there at the church was Gaius and Sosthenes and Stephanus and Crispus, people who they, for, for 18 months they had been building up in, in the Lord and they became leaders there. Centria, east, an eastern port of Corinth, Paul you know, cut his hair. And I wish I had time to talk about that. It was about the Nazarite vow, but, but I don't. I, I'm out of time here. But um, he left. He went to Ephesus and he left Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. And they set a business there. We read later on in 1 Corinthians that they, that they set up a, a church there in their home. And, and, they, and they, they had a church that met and they ministered to people there. And they eventually returned to Rome and did the same thing in Rome later on. They were just very, very devout people. Paul went to the synagogue um, for some, it had to do with the Nazarite vow. And they ended up going from there and going and visiting the churches in the different reason, regions that he had established, encouraging them and building them up. Um, and that was kind of the end of his second missionary journey that started a couple chapters before. 
Some pretty amazing things happened on that journey. I just want to, as I close here, just, just mention a couple things, okay? Uh, maybe some takeaways that we can have. Um, first of all, that God loves us and he cares for us in ways that goes beyond just the normal realm of our experience. He does. I mean, he, he's a supernatural God. And because he lives inside of us, we're supernatural beings. We're not normal. We really are supernatural. And God loves us and cares for us, and he's involved in our lives in supernatural ways. And he does things, you know, that, that, that sometimes we don't see, that we don't recognize. I'm going to leave you with two things that I, I want you to consider, okay? And the first one is this. I want to challenge you for the next week, just for the next seven days, at the end of each day, to write down and say, God, how you maybe saw God in a, in a, in a little small way or even in a big way. Maybe it's just a beautiful sunset and you're going to say that. Maybe you've been praying for someone and all of a sudden they come up and ask you a question that, that opens the door for you to have a conversation. Maybe you have an opportunity to maybe to minister to someone. Matthew 25 says when you do it to that person, you're doing it to Jesus. Maybe you're even entertaining an angel. You never know. How have you experienced God today? And, just, and, and maybe look throughout the day. God, help me to see. Maybe you start to say, God, help me to see you today. And then write down how you saw him. And the second thing is this, I want to remind you of is this, is that God has placed all of us in the world in which we live. All of us. I'm minus 37 seconds. Will you give me one and a half minutes? Okay? Paul took a, a year and a half. I'm not asking for that much, okay? Every single one of us here live in a world that is unique to us. Not all of us um, share um, the exact same world. In fact, none of us do. And what I mean by that is all of us have a very unique group of people that we interact with in our lives. And I, I think, I, I don't know, did I share this with you two weeks ago? No? Okay, good. Um, and, and so our, our lives intersect. Our lives right here from being here intersect. And so we now have some common people. But there is no one that has all the different people and all the different places that I have exactly like I have it. And the same is true for you. And I believe God has placed us in the world in which we operate, in the world in which we live, not by accident, just not by chance, not for, oh, wow, you happen to be here. I believe that he brings many people and places us as his children that he loves to reflect him in that world, to be his witnesses, to allow the light, it says in Matthew 5, of Christ to shine through us just how, how we live our lives through our good works and good deeds, he says, and then through our good words and, and supernatural words of, of truth of who Christ is to enter into people's lives. And I want to encourage you within that world, again, to take that one person in that world of yours, not the hundreds possibly, but just the one and to say, God, I commit that person to you. And you know how I want to see you work, God, more than anything is, is, is in that person's life. I want to see you. I want to be able to write down every day. In, in Tom, he, he did this, or he asked this, or all of a sudden I could see him, th and, and where you're seeing his interaction with you. And I want to do something that's kind of fun, okay? D does everyone have a person's name in your head? Raise your, raise your hand if you do. Okay? And when I say three, I want you to say their name, just their first name, out loud. Now do it, okay? All right? Okay, you just do it, all right? No, no one will be able to hear, okay? If they're next to you, then they'll feel encouraged probably, okay? But, um, okay, so when I say three, I want you to say their name. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, I think seven you said it, okay? Let's say it a little bit louder, okay? Don't be afraid. Just say it. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. All right. That's exciting to me. Well, let's pray. Lord, we love you. And that's why we're here. We want, to, we want to know you through your word. We want to grow in our knowledge of you. We want to grow in our understanding of you. But God, we want your word to change and transform us. We don't want to leave here each week being the same with just maybe a little bit more knowledge. We want to be changed by your spirit working through your word to change our hearts. Father, to be 
a reflection of you in our world. And I pray for courage for everyone here tonight. I pray for the courage for them to see you, to look for you each day this week and for them to see you, Father, move in the life as they pray for their one life, their one life, that they would commit to praying daily for them, for you to open doors. And for they, Father, they may sacrifice time with other people, maybe people that are close friends sometimes, to spend time with them. They would make that sacrifice for eternity's sake. And for that person's sake, because they love and care for them. And we can't wait to see what you're going to do next. That's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless, guys. Love you.